All right, welcome everybody. My name is Aiden Murray, President of Young Americans for Liberty here at University of Nevada, Reno. Um, so I hope everyone got to follow these instructions. If not, you, know, you can do it afterwards. Um, so uh, tonight, we're hosting Gennady Stolyarov II. Uh, he's the current chairman of the United States Transhumanist Party. Um, if you'd like more information on him, he has a website called the rationalargumentator.com. Um, he's actually spoken with us in the past at our Generation of War event where we talked about uh, peace or pursuing peace and diplomacy instead of you know warmongering. Um, so uh, without further ado, you have the floor, Mr. Solarov. Thank you, Mr. Murray. I really appreciate the invitation of the Young Americans for Liberty UNR chapter. It's an honor to be here and to discuss some innovative ideas with you. I try to look beyond established mainstream positions which have gotten us into this trench warfare situation that exists in contemporary politics. But a lot of this trench warfare arises from deficient political rules, deficient processes, insufficient accountability on the part of many branches of government. And the United States Transhumanist Party now also alternatively known as the Transhuman Party, so call it what you will, is focused on trying to break that log jam. And I will explain several ways in which we advocate for doing so. But first I'll give you some background as to the US Transhumanist Party and its origins. We are a relatively new minor political party in the United States. The Transhumanist Party was founded on October 7, 2014 by an individual named Zoltan Istvan. You may have heard of him. He's a very interesting character. Formerly a journalist, a world traveler, he has visited over 100 countries. He has reported on war zones, created documentaries regarding them. He nearly lost his life to a landmine in Vietnam. And after that point, he decided to refocus his career on the struggle to overcome death and disease through the progress of science and technology. He made a lot of money during the real estate boom of the mid-2000s, and that was enough for him to become financially independent and essentially devote his life to advocating the ideas of transhumanism. Transhumanism is both a philosophy and a movement aimed at using science and technology to improve the human condition, essentially to make life better. And as I was discussing briefly before the start of this talk, transhumanism isn't exclusive to any one area of technology. Indeed, many of the devices that we use today can be considered transhumanist in the sense that they broaden or extend our capabilities beyond what we would have unaided. A big aspiration of transhumanism is radical life extension, essentially removing any upper limit on our lifespans by means of the progress of biomedical science and technology, an endeavor that many transhumanists believe would be attainable within our lifetimes given appropriate resource allocation. But also, transhumanism is about pushing forward the frontiers of technological progress in any area that helps human beings. So Zoltan ran for president in 2016, and he did it in a very unusual way. He took a 1978 RV and repurposed it to look like a coffin-shaped bus called the Immortality Bus, and he drove it throughout the country, attracted vast amounts of media coverage, and essentially he was running an educational campaign, uh, much like Ron Paul before him was doing, in the sense that he recognized that the probability of him getting elected to office was very slim. However, if he were to spread awareness about transhumanism, about life extension, about policies that are needed to bring this future about, then that campaign would have fulfilled its purpose. And really, it is the case that a lot more people pay attention to you if you have a political aspect to your educational message. The Immortality Bus could be seen as an art project 
as well. It was certainly quite artfully designed, or a science exhibit. It had a lot of posters and other educational materials in there. But by running for president, uh, he essentially attracted a lot more publicity than he otherwise would have. And he has since largely moved on from the political sphere uh, into being more of a speaker and educator on transhumanism. So after the 2016 elections ended, he approached me and he essentially said, I'm going to step down as chairman of the U.S. Transhumanist Party. Uh, Gennady, would you like to take over? And it is not often that a man driving a coffin-shaped bus hands you a political party. I would say that is the opportunity of a lifetime. So I decided to accept it and guide this party on its next stage of evolution, away from essentially being centered on one individual and his campaign, and toward more broadly representing the aspirations of the transhumanist movement as they relate to the general public. So I opened up the party to free membership. You can go to our website at transhumanist-party.org slash membership, or you can sign up in hard copy using the sign-up sheet here, and it takes less than a minute to become a member of the U.S. Transhumanist Party. We are innovative in our membership approach in the sense that we allow individuals who are not necessarily eligible to vote in the United States to also become what we call allied members. So those could be teenagers who are capable of forming intelligent political opinions. Those could be individuals who reside in other countries who are sympathetic to the ideas of transhumanism and wish to collaborate with us in this movement. Essentially, we believe the ideas of transhumanism are universally applicable. So they transcend boundaries, they transcend nationalities, they transcend ages, genders, ethnic groups, what have you. If we made contact with intelligent extraterrestrial life forms, they would be eligible to become members as well. Or if sentient artificial general intelligences were developed, they would be eligible to become members. So we try to be as inclusive as we possibly can. And so far we have had over 1,300 members join us. We have doubled our membership in the course of the past year. And I hope to grow it to a significantly greater extent. I believe 10,000 members is the crucial threshold for a self-sustaining, self-perpetuating organization. In terms of where we stand relative to the conventional political spectrum, simply put, we seek to transcend it. We are the upwing political party, so we believe the left and the right are essentially obsolete. We want to look upward to humankind's future, toward the stars, toward building up human beings and our civilization, elevating the human condition, overcoming all of the problems that befall our species. Furthermore, we are transpartisan. We have individual members who happen to identify as libertarians, but also others who happen to identify as socialists, people who identify as Democrats, Republicans, centrists, apolitical, or other. There are a lot of members who are just interested in science and technology and see this as a vehicle to advance greater interest in those ideas, but they may not be primarily interested in the political sphere. So I would say, actually, our primary purpose is education combined with advocacy. We understand the electoral road is a very difficult road to travel, and it takes a lot of advanced preparation. And it would need to happen simultaneously with a lot of the reforms that I'm going to be discussing today. And as I mentioned, uh, you can call us by any of several names, the Transhumanist Party or the Transhuman Party, which used to be the name of a small splinter party that we absorbed, but we decided to let individuals uh, have the prerogative to continue using that name, or by the abbreviation USTP, if you're mathematically inclined, USTP in parentheses squared. So what you will, as long as the ideas are recognized and reflected. And in this bottom image here, you see me discussing transhumanist ideas with Ray Kurzweil, uh, one of the most famous futurists. Uh, he is known for discussing the concept of the technological 
singularity, the law of accelerating returns. So I had the chance to interview him in September of 2018, and you can find the recording of that interview online. But the reason why I'm here today, and I think this audience will sympathize with this statement, mainstream politics has failed. We have two major political parties that are rapidly imploding, essentially committing suicide, but attempting to take the rest of the country down with them. Both the Republicans and the Democrats are guilty of cynical, toxic, destructive rhetoric that threatens to spiral out of control, even beyond the wishes of the operatives of the two political parties, into outright violence, as we saw uh, Earlier, uh, in 2017, 2018, in various protests at Berkeley, Charlottesville, uh, numerous other locations uh, that are perhaps too prevalent to uh, list here, but unfortunately, we are seeing an erosion of civil discourse in our country. And instead of being focused on policies and principles, these two political parties have essentially devolved into tribes. And it doesn't even matter to the political operatives anymore what they stand for. What matters to them is, is it coming from my side or is it coming from the opposite side? And they fail to see nuances, they fail to see distinctions, they fail to see that people could agree with part of an agenda but not another part, or that they could be somewhere in the middle, or that they could think in terms of different categories altogether. But they each hope essentially that you will support their side by making you so afraid of the other side that you will primarily vote against the other tribe rather than for uh, one of the mainstream tribes. And in addition to that, they have created very formidable structural barriers, ballot access thresholds, which are extremely stringent. In most jurisdictions, even to run for a fairly minor office, you need to get at least several thousand petition signatures by hand. And even if you're able to get them, the electoral body in that jurisdiction will probably find ways to challenge their legitimacy, especially if that electoral body has been captured by one of the major political parties. In Nevada, you would need about 5,400 petition signatures by hand if you are a minor political party seeking to place your candidates on the ballot in the upcoming elections. So that clearly creates an obstacle to individuals and small organizations with innovative ideas who want to challenge this duopoly. There's also the fact that the Republican and Democratic parties control the Commission on Presidential Debates. They've intentionally excluded candidates like Gary Johnson and Jill Stein in 2016, even though those, those candidates were doing fairly well in the polls at that time and their exclusion caused their poll numbers to plummet. Even when the poll numbers do not plummet, uh, the major political parties influence the media to cover the polls in a very biased way and exclude promising contenders from the poll results as displayed on television. I saw this happen a lot with Ron Paul in 2008 and 2012. I saw this happen with Gary Johnson in 2016. They did well, they could have gotten second or third place in the polls, and the media channels would show the first place finisher and the fourth place finisher. They would overlook somebody who was politically inconvenient to the Republicans or the Democrats. And on the left side of the political spectrum, a strong argument could be made that Bernie Sanders received a very similar treatment in 2016. But another type of barrier is attitudinal, this pernicious wasted vote mentality, that unless you vote for one of these tribes or the other, you're throwing your vote away. I say throwing your vote away is voting for something that you don't personally believe in. Because ultimately, as an individual, you cannot sway the outcome of a national election. Even if the electoral college weren't there, you still couldn't sway the outcome of a national election. There are too many votes. Now, you could sway the outcome of a U.S. transhumanist party election if you join us as a member, or you could sway the outcome of a local election in certain cases. But on a national level, what your vote does is it signals your preference and 
whoever gets elected will look at the vote totals and may think, well, what do my constituents really want if I really want to appeal to more of these constituents so that they vote for me next time? What types of ideas should I listen to or try to implement? That would be a pretty decent politician who thought that way uh, in the first place. But what you can do is you can try to send that signal by voting your conscience. But that's a difficult insight to convey. In particular, because there's this empirical tendency called uh, Duvarger's Law. Uh, Maurice Duvarger was a French politician, political theorist in the middle of the 20th century, and he essentially posited that there's at least a tendency in any system that has a plurality or winner-take-all or first-past-the-post type of rule for this two-party system, this duopoly, to emerge. And the reason why that happens generally is because if people are focused on winning a given election, they'll try to form coalitions of unrelated interests that attempt to capture a little more than 50% of the vote. And that's what we have in the United States. We have two coalitions that are kind of agglomerations of policy views that aren't necessarily compatible, or at least you can envision people holding some of those views uh, or not others. Uh, for example, the Republican Party has members of its coalition who are opposed to abortion, other members who are opposed to gun control, others who support lower taxes or greater economic freedom. Hypothetically, you could conceive of positions that uh, embrace some of those views but not others. And, and likewise, uh, on the side of the Democratic Party, you have people who are gen generally pro-immigration, uh, people who are generally pro-labor unions, uh, you have people who are for stricter environmental laws, there's no reason why those positions inherently go together. And uh, I could go on just on that subject for the entirety of this presentation. But unfortunately, in the mix of all of these mutually unrelated issues, a big one is left out, and that is technological progress. We don't see prominent politicians of either party discussing the impacts of technological progress on human incentives, on the human condition, and the truly transformative ways in which even our lives within living memory have changed as a result of technology. When they do talk about technology, it tends to be fear-laden rhetoric, like fear of automation taking away jobs. But they don't talk about the benefits of automation. They don't talk about the benefits of medical progress, or, for instance, how space colonization could expand our access to resources. So we need a party that is going to focus on these areas that the major parties overlook. And it should be a party that's at the same time sensibly moderate, steering clear of this toxic, vitriolic, partisan rhetoric, and radically progressive, in the sense that we don't just look at the next election cycle, we don't just seek to win, we seek to anticipate the long-term future of humanity, and using science, technology, and reason, try to shape it in the best possible way. And furthermore, we are the only political party right now in the United States that specifically refuses to demonize people for political gain. We really believe in focusing on policies, on solutions, not ad hominem attacks, not defeating one particular individual or one particular political party. In 2020, uh, you're going to hear a lot of appeals about why you need to vote a certain way in order to defeat Donald Trump or prevent the evil socialist Democrats from coming into power. And I would just urge you to resist those appeals because no matter how bad those individuals or entities are portrayed as being, it is not worth it to surrender your genuine preference in order to essentially buy into uh, this duopolistic narrative. Rather, uh, I would encourage you to think about technologies of 
life extension, artificial intelligence, biotechnology, nanotechnology, genetic engineering, space colonization, automation, vertical farming, miniaturization, any of a wide array of fields, cryptocurrencies, encryption, any of these areas are going to be more transformative for the future of humankind than either the Republican or the Democratic Party. And we do need to work to overcome age-old problems. A fellow transhumanist activist in the movement, Jim Stroll, likes to say, uh, we need to recognize that our common enemy is death, not one another. And I would broaden his statement to say, uh, we came into a world that is rather indifferent to our own existence. The forces of nature don't really care whether we live or die, but nature does operate by certain laws. And as Sir Francis Bacon said, nature to be commanded must be obeyed. So science and technology aim to understand and harness those natural laws for the purpose of improving the human condition, creating the kind of world we want to live in, both materially and socially. So with that, I will branch into the U.S. Transhumanist Party platform. The U.S. Transhumanist Party platform was developed over the course of 2017. And the way in which this platform was developed is actually an example of the ideas that I'm going to discuss today. Because this wasn't written by one individual. It was adopted in the course of six rather extensive electronic ranked preference votes of our members. We have 82 planks thus far. In terms of length, our platform rivals those of the Republican and Democratic parties, and I would say it exceeds them in terms of the depth of substance. But I'll give you an example of how ranked preference voting works. I know you may not be able to see the text in entirety, but this is an example of an actual ballot question that we had in late 2017 when it came time to consider proposed amendments to one of the sections of our platform. And this was our anti-bigotry section. Initially, that section s uh, singled out certain so-called alt-right political movements that incited violence. And by the way, the Transhumanist Party opposes all forms of political violence, no matter by whom it's initiated or for what ostensible purpose. But one of our members suggested, well, there are various alt-left groups that engage in political violence as well. So uh, should they be encompassed within the list of groups uh, that we do not condone? And that was one of the wording options. Another one of our members said, but wait a minute, what about self-defense? And if there is an incident of political violence, shouldn't people have the right to defend themselves? So his wording was another alternative. Another member uh, suggested, well, why are we listing groups at all? Shouldn't we just simplify the wording and say we don't approve of political violence or hatefulness or bigotry, uh, no matter by who initiated? So that was another version. And a fourth uh, member refined upon that wording, expanded the general principles of it. And of course, one option was keep the prior version of section two of our platform. And with a rank preference vote, you can see what our members saw on the ballot, and they could read all of the proposed wordings as well. But you don't get to vote for just one option. You get to rank order all of them in exactly your preference order. And then when that happens, the option that gets the lowest number of votes in the first round, the lowest number of first votes, would be eliminated. And the people who selected uh, that option would have their number two votes reassigned as number one votes. And this iterative process happens until you have a majority for one of the options. So you can see here, the membership was quite split on the options that it preferred. But Amendment 2-1 got the smallest number of first preference votes. So on the first round, 2-1 would be eliminated, and whatever the people who selected 2-1 designated as their second choice would get added to the total of first votes, and this process would repeat. And on this slide, you can see two ways of tabulating the results. The one uh, on 
your left, my right, uh, was tabulated by a biological intelligence at the time that was our only recourse. Uh, but essentially, it went through the instant runoff process and it came out to Amendment 2-4 prevailing after the third round. Then afterward, we located an online platform that actually automatically tabulates these uh, instant runoff results. Uh, so you can hold a ranked preference vote in a fairly simple manner using Google Forms. And if you record your results in a specific way, you can input them into this program and it does the calculations for you. And it was gratifying to see the result was exactly the same. Uh, you can see this program also generates its own narrative, but I'll point out one difference. And this is one area in which algorithms as well as artificial intelligence is never going to be able to surpass humankind, and that is in verbosity or uh, ornateness of phrasing, in that you can see this narrative by the algorithm is very simple, very concise, but perhaps we humans should, let's say, maximize our unique comparative and absolute advantage in the use of ornate rhetoric. But what we ultimately want is for more participation in the political process by intelligent laypersons. Right now, the political process is dominated by concentrated special interests that can afford to employ lobbyists and influence elected and appointed officials very closely. And this is a dynamic that has been extensively studied by the Public Choice School of Economics. Essentially, when the government is capable of conferring certain special favors, there come to be concentrated benefits from advocating for certain special treatment for certain groups at the expense of dispersed costs throughout the general population. So you might be one dollar poorer because of a certain bad policy, or you might spend more time waiting in line, or you might just have missed opportunities. Uh, essentially, as uh, Frédéric Bastiat, the great classical liberal 19th century economist and political theorist wrote, there is the seen and the unseen, and the unseen is what doesn't happen bad policy. What doesn't happen because of a bad policy could be quite severe. People's life expectancies might not be extended in a dramatic way if medical progress is slowed down by years or by decades. Many millions of people might die from diseases. And what we see is just that people continue to die from the diseases that they've been dying of historically. And a lot of people will say, well, this is unfortunate, but such as the way of the world, but maybe it doesn't have to be the way of the world if we can solve this public choice problem, if we can mitigate the damage done by the special interests who are seeking concentrated benefits at the public's expense. So we want to inform and empower intelligent laypersons, including through technologies of education, of information dissemination. And furthermore, we would like to see substantially greater inclusion of third parties or minor political parties in the US electoral system. One important way of doing this is through shifting to a proportional representation system. Right now we have a plurality or winner take all or first past the post system where essentially if a given party captures 51% of the votes in a given jurisdiction, they control the offices in that jurisdiction. A proportional system would mean if your party got 10% of the votes, you get 10% of the seats from that jurisdiction in the legislative body. And I would say that is a lot more representative because minority viewpoints exist as well. It's not just the ability to attract 51% support that determines whether your interests are legitimate. Now, uh, Duverger studied systems that have proportional representation as well. And he concluded that unlike systems that have this plurality rule, systems with proportional representation tend to end up in a multi-party equilibrium. Like a lot of parliamentary democracies where what ends up happening is multiple parties get seats in the legislature and then 
in order to form a government, they create coalitions amongst themselves. The advantage of that is the coalitions are more fluid. They can shift over time. So the people aren't locked into these binary tribes. So you could have uh, one party focused on a given issue that wants to get its policies implemented, but the other parties that it's in a coalition with might shift with each election season. And that could break certain log jams, enable certain progress to happen. We also want to eliminate these stringent ballot access requirements. I'll give you an example. One of the candidates the Transhumanist Party endorsed in 2018 was James D. Schultz, who ran for Assembly District 2 in New York. And he actually had a lot of libertarian sentiments as well. And a lot of libertarians in New York helped him gather petition signatures by hand. He got 1,239 petition signatures. So he put forth a very diligent effort. But the threshold for running for that office was 1,500 signatures. And just because he fell a little bit short of that threshold, he wasn't even able to run for office, notwithstanding that a lot of people were interested in his candidacy. So that, in my view, is an injustice. I think ballot access should be as open to as many candidates as possible and let the people choose uh, whom they consider to be the best and most qualified. We also support political experimentation. So how many of you know what CSTEDs are? You do. Excellent. So CSTEDs, for those of you who don't know, are modular floating ocean platforms. Essentially think of them as city blocks on water. And they could connect and disconnect to one another and form these autonomous communities, which can be experiments in governance. And if the owner of one of these modular blocks is displeased with what is happening in that community, that owner can detach the platform and essentially move it somewhere else, connect with another set of blocks. So there have been a lot of interesting uh, concepts for Seasteads. Uh, the one shown here is called Artisanopolis. It won a design contest for the Seasteading Institute back in 2015. And these images you can find and download for free online. So now there's an organization called Blue Frontiers that is attempting to work with various national governments and create these incubator Seasteads that will cooperate with the laws of their host countries. But uh, essentially attempt to advance the infrastructure and the technology of these floating platforms. The advantage of CSTEDs is that you could have political experiments, you could have new constitutions, you could have new voting systems, uh, new approaches toward property or membership in the jurisdiction. Some of them will work, some of them will fail, but established jurisdictions tend to not want to be first in adopting any idea. But if they see the results of those experiments, maybe politicians in some of those jurisdictions might put forward more innovative proposals. We also support micronations. How many of you know about the Principality of Sealand? You do. Oh, a lot of you do. Excellent, excellent. So Sealand is essentially a repurposed British World War II era fortress off the coast of the British Isles. And in the 1960s, a gentleman by the name of Roy Bates operated a pirate radio station uh, on this platform and decided to declare independence from the UK because uh, technically the fortress was in international waters and the UK had abandoned it. And de facto, the Bates family has maintained the autonomy of this platform now for over 50 years. Also, how many of you know that there's a micronation in northern Nevada? Ah, excellent. Most of you know about the Republic of Molossia then. So uh, if you haven't visited Molossia in Dayton, I encourage you to do that. Uh, this is an older picture of me with President Kevin Baugh of Molossia. Now, I also have a title of nobility from the Principality of Sealand, which I acquired in the old-fashioned way, that is by purchase. And <laughs> it is true. Most titles of nobility were purchased by some individuals who happened to aid their monarch or sovereign in some way. Uh, so this is just an updated version of that. I am a baron of Sealand, and I visited Molossia. 
we had an official state ceremony here where our respective mm -hmm. flags were flown. And it is just a coincidence that the colors of the flag of Sealand and the colors of the U.S. Transhumanist Party, orange and black, uh, are the same. But I have outfits that fit the occasion. But really, micronations, I think, are important because they challenge us to think about what constitutes a government, what constitutes sovereignty. Is it really a matter of getting international recognition uh, by the UN or by other states? Or is it enough to have de facto autonomy, de facto decision-making power to experiment with new ideas and new models of government? Electoral reforms are extremely important because the current electoral system creates many roadblocks to progress. One of these roadblocks, I would argue, is the Electoral College. And this is a controversial statement even among libertarians because there could be some valid arguments for an Electoral College. Valid arguments were put forth by the framers of the U.S. Constitution. But the way they envisioned the Electoral College system is very different from how it actually turned out. They actually envisioned people in a given state voting for individual electors who those people considered uh, persons of exceptional knowledge and discernment and good judgment in selecting a president. And the electors that were actually supposed to confer amongst themselves and have a substantive discussion about who the president should be. This is not how it has turned out. The way it has turned out is if a given candidate from one of the two political parties gets the majority of the popular vote in a given state, then all of the electors from that state get picked by that political party of that candidate. So the Republicans have their own slate of electors for any given state. The Democrats have their own slate of electors for any given state. And whoever of their candidates wins the popular vote gets that party's slate of electors and the party essentially mandates that these electors uh, pledge themselves to vote for that candidate. Actually, technically speaking, the electors are supposed to vote for whomever they uh, believe is the best choice. The so-called faithless electors are actually the most faithful to the original principles behind the Electoral College. Uh, so as an interesting bit of trivia, the third place finisher officially in the 2016 presidential elections was a person who never even ran for president, Colin Powell. He got three electoral votes from the state of Washington. Also, an individual who didn't run for office in 2016, but finally got recognized in the Electoral College was Ron Paul, because a faithless Republican elector from Texas cast a vote for Ron Paul. And that's actually what they should have done. What more electors should have done, voted their conscience, just as we encourage individual voters to do. But the way the Electoral College has turned out, it merely entrenches this partisan duopoly. Uh, neither of the two political parties, nor any political party, are written into the US Constitution. George Washington warned against political parties and political factions, and yet we have this system where uh, the parties dominate, including through mechanisms like the Electoral College. Also, one problem with current electoral campaigns is it seems like we're in a perpetual election season now. Even before 2019 started, the 2020 election campaign season was well underway. And there's this horse race mentality where, aided by the mass media, there's this drive for sensationalist coverage, new uh, juicy controversies for people to tune into uh, the television channels to watch and for the television channels to accumulate ratings. And very often, because of short attention spans among the general public, the most significant issues get overlooked, including both the merits of candidates, like what policy positions they supported, what actual accomplishments they might have had, and the outrageous behavior of certain candidates that should have perhaps disqualified them but gets forgotten after a week or after a month. So for that reason, the U.S. Transhumanist Party advocates greatly shortening the time frames of election campaigns. It shouldn't take more than a few months 
for people to receive the information that they need in order to make an informed decision. But most importantly, all of that information should be in the forefront of their consideration. If they heard something in January 2019, I wonder if they'll remember it in November 2020, or if they'll just focus on the latest scandal of the week. Furthermore, staggered party primaries really disenfranchise a lot of people. Because let's say, even in the major political parties, initially you have some diversity of thought. You might have 10 candidates entering the Iowa caucuses or the New Hampshire primaries. And then several of them drop out because preliminary indications of support are not there. But what if you're in Texas or California or even Nevada and you preferred one of those candidates who dropped out? By the time the primaries get to your state, you are much more constrained than those early voters. And furthermore, you are at that point pressured by the party machinery to support the presumptive nominee and hold your nose because, oh, that evil other party's candidate might win instead unless you fall in line. And that's a very pernicious calculus. I think it's quite unfair to subject a, even loyal supporters of the two major political parties in those later primary states to that. So, in the view of the Transhumanist Party, all primaries should be held on the same day throughout the country so that all of the voters within any political party have an equal degree of influence on who gets selected. And hopefully they can do that through a ranked preference ballot with instant runoffs so that they also indicate their entire preference set. So, I already mentioned ranked preference voting and proportional representation and how we support replacing this winner-take-all plurality system with these mechanisms. Because with right preference voting, really the lesser evil argument doesn't hold even under, uh, let's say, a very crudely pragmatic calculus. The very crudely pragmatic calculus would be, oh, I only want to vote for a candidate who has a chance of winning. Well, you don't really know who has a chance of winning anymore because now those suboptimal candidates that previously would have commanded the plurality out of fear, now they're just a few candidates out of uh, a much larger field. Uh, so with a ranked preference system, you can get some surprising results, but they actually tend to be more in line with, uh, let's say, moderate uh, or centrist kinds of preferences because you don't have an extremist faction that might have 15% or 20% of support within a given party, but that happens to be a plurality of support within a divided field uh, getting hold and coming to control the party, which uh, I believe has actually happened in the United States over the past several election cycles. We have an imbalance of power in various other respects. In terms of proportional representation, the Transhumanist Party doesn't just support proportional representation of parties, but also proportional representation of professions, occupations, backgrounds in government. It is really unfortunate that while attorneys comprise about 0.6% of the U.S. population, they comprise over 40% of elected representatives in virtually all legislatures, including Congress. And while attorneys have some valid perspectives and skill sets to contribute. Certainly, if that perspective predominates, we have a problem. One reason why we have a problem is attorneys create laws to try to create more work for attorneys. And the way you create more work for attorneys is by deliberately injecting ambiguity and gray areas into the laws so that then situations of conflict or misunderstanding have to be manually resolved by expensive attorneys in each case. People of many other backgrounds don't think that way. People from mathematical, scientific, engineering backgrounds tend to think in a very different way. They want clear-cut solutions that are as easily scalable as possible and as easy to determine in advance as possible. So that's a very different set of incentives to follow. And sometimes one perspective is more valid, sometimes the other perspective is more valid depending on the issue and the nuances of the issue that you're looking at. But at least let's have that uh, constructive engagement in politics instead of having one profession get its way in the majority of instances. 
how about people who uh, work in the arts, uh, people who work in education, people who uh, work in social services? Uh, shouldn't they also have the ability to bring forth their perspectives uh, in terms of crafting policy? And this, by the way, is not something that can be legislated because setting strict occupational quotas uh, is not going to work and it's going to be gained. Rather, there should be more encouragement, again, for intelligent laypersons to participate in the political process. And I think with that, that problem could take care of itself over time. But one aspect of our government that is disproportionately powerful is the executive branch. The power of the president greatly exceeds what the framers originally envisioned, to the point where now the president of the United States has the power literally to destroy the entire world at his sole wish. So he can press the nuclear red button and launch a preemptive strike on any country, and uh, of course the result will be retaliation and the destruction of intelligent life on Earth. No human being should have that power. Not even an immensely wise, careful, prudent, restrained human being who never has fits of ill temper, who never calls people names, who never gets outraged at the slightest provocation. Uh, maybe at some point we had a president like that. I don't know. But uh, no human being, especially not today, should be trusted with that kind of authority. Also, how has it come to be that the president can unilaterally order military attacks when it's actually the prerogative of Congress to declare war? How has it come to be that the president can unilaterally order somebody, including an American citizen, to be indefinitely detained or imprisoned or spied on or even assassinated? And this has happened under both Democratic and Republican administrations, so it's not a partisan problem by any means. It's a problem of the executive branch being too powerful. And whether somebody likes Donald Trump or hates Donald Trump, one wouldn't want to be uh, in a position where that power is in the hands of somebody who one considers a political adversary. Now, the president also, for whatever reason, has come to have the authority to enter into and exit from international agreements. One very dangerous decision that Donald Trump recently made was to remove the United States from the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty that had been in place with Russia and before then the Soviet Union since 1987. That treaty essentially barred both countries from deploying short-range nuclear missiles that could be used in a tactical capacity. Without the restraint of that treaty, some forces within each of these world powers may decide, oh, now nuclear weapons are no longer off limits in what they think could still be a contained conflict. But of course, that still risks major escalation and the destruction of the human species. By the way, one of the major focuses of the Transhumanist Party is on existential risk and minimizing and eliminating sources of existential risk. And we perceive the risk of nuclear war to be the greatest existential risk facing our species. If we can find a way to dismantle the nuclear arsenals of all the major world powers and repurpose those weapons for civilian use, say, peaceful nuclear energy, that would be a great burden, a great hazard alleviated. And furthermore, the judicial branch is supposed to be objective and impartial, but we have seen a disgraceful politicization of the appointments of Supreme Court justices. I think that politicization has reached its nadir thus far with the confirmation hearings of Brett Kavanaugh, where essentially both parties have stopped caring about the objective merits of a person's jurisprudence and they're willing to strike very low blows just to affect the composition of the Supreme Court and do so in anticipation of how those judges will rule. And judges aren't really supposed to rule in a partisan manner anyway. They're supposed to objectively analyze the issues and come to a conclusion based on the merits of the case and based on the law that applies to the case rather than what the Democratic Party wants or 
what the Republican Party wants. Germaneness rules are very important. A germaneness rule is essentially a single subject rule. One bill can cover one subject area. In Nevada, there is a modified version of a germaneness rule within the Nevada legislature in that a given bill can only affect uh, one chapter or a set of related chapters of NRS, the Nevada Revised Statutes. Uh, but you could conceive of an even stricter germaneness rule which prevents unrelated provisions from being inserted into bills. The types of omnibus monstrosities that we have at the federal level stem from the lack of a germaneness rule where you could have, for instance, a bill about national parks and in there there's a farm subsidy somewhere. And if a politician wants to pass a particular proposal related to national parks, he or she is going to have to weigh that against the farm subsidy and think, well, uh, maybe this measure about national parks is important enough for me that uh, I'll overlook this farm subsidy component. I don't care about it strongly enough. So the proponents of the farm subsidy just got to sneak it in. And generally, at the federal level, you have these vast omnibus types of legislation every single year, including for the purpose of uh, creating the new federal budget. So this is why we had the federal shutdown recently, because one issue, the issue of the border wall, uh, held back the entirety of the rest of the measures that would have funded the operation of the federal government, including measures that were fairly uncontroversial to members of both political parties, but they disrupted a lot of processes that people, for better or for worse, have come to rely upon. So a germaneness rule has many advantages. It definitely simplifies bills, allows people to consider the issues on their merits, and prevents sneaky behavior by special interests that might try to sneak in some uh, controversial or detrimental proposal within a large bill that very few politicians are actually going to read in full. Now, this quote by Nancy Pelosi has become a trope by now. In 2010, she said of the Affordable Care Act, we have to pass the bill so that you can find out what is in it. And indeed, we have been finding out what is in that bill for <laughs> now the remainder of this decade. But this speaks to a very real problem in Congress, and that is these bills are so huge, and sometimes they're dropped at the last minute, and representatives and senators do not have the time or the inclination to read all of that bill text. So a way to solve that is to create minimum consideration time frames for legislation that are proportional to the lengths of the bills. And not even for singular bills, but all of the legislation that is before the legislative body for consideration. So let's say the legislative body is only allowed to consider 20 pages per day. And if a bill has more than 20 pages, then the consideration period shifts to multiple days. And they have to have that reading period before they can vote on the legislation. And of course, it takes less than 24 hours to read 20 pages, but they'll have time to discuss it. They'll have time to uh, consider whether that's the best option or whether alternatives could be feasible. But also with regard to amendments, sometimes you could have an innocuous bill that gets hijacked by a special interest later on and they inject a voluminous amendment, sometimes an unrelated amendment, into that bill. If amendments require the same degree of consideration, the same minimum time frames of consideration, that problem could be resolved as well. And furthermore, it would promote transparency of discussion. Sometimes you do have public hearings on legislation, and the public hearings go a certain way, but then an amendment is proposed at the last minute, and the legislators will just vote on the amendment because behind closed doors, they had an understanding with a special interest. So uh, this type of minimum consideration time frame would prevent that problem from arising. Also, because we are the transhumanist party, we consider the potential applications for technology, how about using technology to solve the problem of gerrymandering, where political parties design uh, 
districts for legislative offices in such a manner as to have those districts be easily won by members of their parties. You can see these strange shapes of congressional districts in Florida, Texas, Illinois, North Carolina. The only reasons why those districts are of those shapes is because it's easy for either a Democrat or a Republican to win in those districts every single time. But if you had objective criteria for redistricting, for instance, criteria related to changes in the population or uh, geographic proximity or maybe similarities uh, in certain fundamental ways, like in terms of the industries that are prevalent in a community, the terms of, in terms of the businesses, in terms of other patterns of life, then you would have more diversity of viewpoints within jurisdictions. And they won't be as easily capturable by one party or the other. So the Transhumanist Party proposes developing AI, artificial intelligence algorithms, that would be transparent and publicly viewable and subject to public scrutiny and criticism that could be deployed to essentially engage in redistricting exercises rather than having this be decided by whatever party happens to be in power at the time redistricting is done. We also support development of an AI analysis system for the risks of prospective legislation. Again, this wouldn't be a system that actually has the power to make decisions. It would be rather a system that could evaluate risks along a multiplicity of dimensions and perhaps generate a combined score and have the scoring algorithm be publicly known and transparent and subject to discussion about whether that's the most valid algorithm. But that AI system could then have its results contribute to the discussion about a particular measure so that at least the politicians who are considering it will have more than just their own party's views on it in making that decision. And I'll point out the caveat, algorithmic bias is a real phenomenon. You could have algorithms that are designed with flawed assumptions or that have flawed data or that are themselves influenced by these partisan forces or might be influenced by subtler biases of their creators. And those are concerns to look out for. But they're better problems to have in many respects than the overt partisan bias that doesn't even pretend to be objective anymore. Government accountability uh, can come in a variety of ways, but it's essentially uh, a set of measures to ensure that office holders do what it is that they're supposed to legitimately do within the scope of their duties and not transgress beyond that scope. A lot has been said about conflicts of interest among government officials uh, with regard to perhaps being unduly influenced by private entities, businesses, religious groups, labor unions, activist groups, uh, certain influential individuals. Sometimes it's very difficult to discern who is being influenced by who or by what, and it's not transparent to the public at all. A lot of very minute rules have been promulgated in an attempt to prevent those conflicts of interest or have them disclosed or essentially micromanage officials every move. And those rules can help prevent certain petty improprieties, like somebody accepting a $1,000 gift from a lobbyist. A relatively minor transgression, all things considered. But the major improprieties, uh, the revolving door that often exists between uh, government office holders and uh, powerful private constituencies cannot be addressed by that means. So if you really want to minimize improper influence on government officials, it's necessary to deprive governments of the ability to grant special economic favors to some parties at the expense of others. To redesign the policy making prerogative so that it can only serve the general interest and not any special interest. One way to do it would be to require any legislator putting forth a proposal to essentially sign an affidavit saying that in this particular area, they have no conflict of interest. They haven't been influenced by any private party that would benefit from 
to that proposal, and instead they're only suggesting it because they think it's good policy. Now, could this be gamed uh, in certain circumstances? Yes, uh, it might be. Say that person could tell his or her friend, who is also a legislator, well, why don't you put forward that bill? So there are still uh, possible ways of gaming the system. With any single accountability measure, there are possible ways of gaming the system, but perhaps multiple measures in combination could close some of those loopholes. Another concept that is important that has been advocated by the Transhumanist Party is surveillance. Now, surveillance is distinguished from surveillance. Uh, both of those terms uh, come from French. Uh, surveillance is essentially viewing from above, monitoring of the population by the government. Surveillance is viewing from below, essentially monitoring of officials of the government by the population. And there are many technologies of surveillance that are now available. One very easy technology that is already being implemented in many venues is live streaming of public hearings and discussions among legislative bodies. There are live streams of Congress, but they're not as user-friendly as they could be. And if they were accompanied, say, by links to the proposed legislation being discussed, it would be easier for people monitoring those live streams to follow what is happening. Uh, this, by the way, is already the case in Nevada. So if you uh, want to go on the website of the Nevada legislature, you can watch both live and archived public hearings and fairly readily get access to the bills that are discussed as well as the documentation submitted by uh, the various parties testifying on those bills. So I think Nevada is ahead of the curve compared to much of the rest of the country in actually implementing these ideas. Now, you see here uh, an image of another important surveillance technology. That's a body camera on a police officer. So a body camera helps make sure that the police officers are enforcing the law within the scope of their authority and they're not going beyond the authority. They're not arbitrarily shooting people or uh, inflicting gratuitous violence. Now, there are issues with body cameras uh, where the police officer could claim conveniently, oh, the camera wasn't on at the time of the event, or the camera would have been on and recorded the footage, but the footage is held by the law enforcement agency, and if it's inconvenient, then the law enforcement agency decides not to share it or claim that it's been lost. So one way to get around that is require the footage to be transmitted to some sort of external repository that's publicly accessible and off limits to law enforcement so that perhaps even you could go on the internet and have a live feed of a police officer's webcam and monitor what that police officer is doing while on duty. So if he's stopping someone for a traffic infraction, you can see whether he's treating that person appropriately. Now, also, governments do provide a wide range of services, and there can be legitimate dispute about whether those services should be provided by government, but the fact is, in the status quo, governments maintain a lot of roads, they maintain a lot of utilities, they maintain a lot of educational and healthcare facilities, and the Transhumanist Party believes that if the status quo, the state of the law, is such that government is providing these services de facto, then they should be provided well. They should be provided with quality. Because whether you're driving on a government road or a private road, it would be better for that road not to have potholes. It would be better for that road not to be congested. It would be better for that road to have fewer accidents. So if our money is being spent on funding a service, we want to make sure that a good job, an efficient job, is done that actually serves the intended purposes uh, for providing that service. And also, if the government is funding research, and this happens a lot in various areas of science and technology and medicine, the results of that research should be made freely and publicly available to the taxpayers who funded that research. For a long time, much federally funded research was held behind paywalls by private journals like Elsevier. So Elsevier would not be doing anything to contribute to the creation of that research. That research would be done in universities, sometimes with federal grants, sometimes without federal grants. 
but Elsevier would require people to pay $30 uh, for access to each journal article unless they were students with an institution that had a subscription to the journal. So people were paying for this research twice, once through their taxes, and again through uh, paying for these academic journals. Now a lot of progress has been made uh, toward removing those paywalls. Uh, even the Obama administration has issued certain directives, essentially requiring much federal research to be made freely available. In the European Union, uh, there has also been a significant movement in that direction. And privately, the Gates Foundation has essentially said, for all the research that it funds, it expects the results to be released to the public without these paywalls. So again, these are fairly realistic near-term types of proposals that we advocate. Now, with regard to one type of federal agency, there's a particularly egregious lack of accountability. And here I'm discussing agencies tasked with, quote, national security, agencies like the NSA, the CIA, the FBI, which often is in practice, do whatever it is they want and claim that it's classified and refuse to disclose the information even to members of Congress, but really in many cases, classified means the release of this information would be embarrassing to uh, certain segments or certain agencies or certain individuals within the US government. And that is not a valid criterion, in my view, for classifying information. So the Transhumanist Party believes that a much smaller subset of information should be classified than currently is. And furthermore, in terms of surveillance, uh, we think there is a role for surveillance beyond just police. Uh, if elected officials interact with members of the public in a public forum, the more recordings uh, we have of that, the more uh, essentially verifiable records we have of that, the easier it is to go back and say to a politician, well, at this point you articulated this idea, but now you seem to be uh, doing something contrary to that, or uh, perhaps going back on your promise. So surveillance is a way to keep track and hold politicians to account for statements that they make. Now, what can we do? And that includes those of you in this room, those of you who are watching the video of this presentation, and anybody who is interested in making a constructive difference. First, if you know of candidates at the local level or the state level who are running as independents or nonpartisan candidates or considering such campaigns and have some of the ideas that uh, I've expressed here, or at least an affinity to those ideas, please let me know. Because the way the Transhumanist Party works, even though we don't have ballot access at present for the reasons I've articulated, we are able to endorse a candidate and bring more attention to that candidate. And of course, if that candidate runs as an independent, there are qualification requirements for the candidate that he or she has to meet. And we, of course, support people abiding by uh, whatever laws are applicable, including campaign finance laws, even if they're irrational or overly stringent. But when I ran as a candidate for the Board of Trustees of the Indian Hills General Improvement District in Douglas County, Nevada, I filed the official paperwork. I made my campaign finance disclosure statements electronically to the Secretary of State's office and they had all zero values in them because I didn't spend any money, I didn't accept any donations for my campaign. But that is what a candidate for that office was required to do. So I believe there's a path for the Transhumanist Party to grow by endorsing these independent candidates who then individually would be expected to run their own campaigns. We are going to have a transhumanist presidential primary process later in 2019 where we're going to try to essentially embody a lot of the ideas that I discussed. It will be a primary that will be held on one day 
simultaneously among all the members of the Transhumanist Party. Prior to that time, we'll have several months of campaigning and virtual debates. So we want to have as many candidates as possible come forward and share ideas and attract as much coverage as they can. Again, because the principal purpose of this exercise will be educational. So we'll have virtual debates. Maybe we'll even have some in-person debates and discussions amongst these candidates. And hopefully we'll have media coverage. We'll have journalists who are interested in this growing new phenomenon of transhumanism and how science and technology relate to politics. But we have one key restriction for our candidates is uh, they cannot be running on behalf of any of the other political parties. And one reason for that is we want to avoid the fate of the Futurist Party. The Futurist Party was formed on the social media site Reddit. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with what Reddit is. Uh, I see a lot of you nodding. So, uh, Reddit can be an interesting place, but at times a deeply suboptimal place to say the least. But the Futurist Party was a more idealistic group on Reddit. They tried to form essentially a a decentralized political party uh, that would vote on policy issues related to science and technology using Reddit as a platform. And then in 2015, they decided to vote to endorse Bernie Sanders for president. And of course, you know what happened then. Bernie Sanders ran his campaign and then he conceded, ultimately endorsed Hillary Clinton. So all of the energy of the Bernie Sanders supporters, including the Futurist Party members who just comprised a very small stream of supporters flowing into the Bernie Sanders campaign, ultimately went to Hillary Clinton. And you know what happened with that campaign. So we do not want to be a minor feeder organization into uh, either of the established political parties. We always want transhumanist ideas to be a, a distinctive alternative, at least until the point in time when politicians from across the political spectrum will be able to call themselves transhumanists and maybe have appellations like Republican transhumanist or Democratic transhumanist or Green transhumanist or Libertarian transhumanist, and at the point at which politicians of multiple competing parties are running and calling themselves transhumanists, essentially we will have won, and the role of the transhumanist party will have been satisfied. But until then, uh, we need to maintain a distinctive political identity, which is why I say candidates need to be independent or nonpartisan. But if you know of someone who would be in alignment with our ideas, please let me know. And by the way, I don't even rule out an independent candidate like Howard Schultz, the former Starbucks CEO, from being on our primary ballot as long as he maintains an independent run and doesn't concede before the end. So what are the criteria for being such a candidate? Unfortunately, you have to be 35 years old or older, and you have to be a natural born citizen of the United States. I know that is very sad, but that is what the US Constitution currently says. And furthermore, that candidate would need to be self-funded, because the Transhumanist Party by design is a non-monetary organization. Uh, as the Transhumanist Party, we neither accept donations nor spend any money that enables us not to have to adhere to campaign finance laws because we're not financing anything. But individual candidates can finance their own campaigns and then we can be an informational conduit for them and spread public awareness regarding their campaign and their policy priorities. Also, please join us uh, because if we reach 10,000 members, I think we can be a sustainable political force in the United States for many years and decades to come. I use 10,000 members as the threshold because that's when we have enough very active members to fill all of the leadership slots no matter what happens to a given individual. So perhaps someday I would want to take a vacation or uh, allow myself to uh, become sick without having to worry about what's going to happen to the transhumanist party in the meantime. And we're not there yet with 1,300 members. But the more individuals join us, the better. And by the way, 
if you join us, you're going to be able to influence the evolution of our platform going forward. So uh, if you want to have more uh, liberty-oriented ideas in our platform, uh, that's definitely something that we're open to. And by the way, I'm going to say that to uh, any group whose members uh, I'm going to try to convince to join the political party. That is, if you want to have proportionally greater influence, uh, signing up for free membership is the way to do that. And furthermore, there are allied individuals and organizations who may not consider themselves transhumanists, but who may have good policy ideas, who may craft draft legislation that we could stand behind or develop policy papers that explore the interaction of technology and politics. So we are always open to that kind of collaboration. We have a state-of-the-art website, transhumanist-party.org. We already have large amounts of content there. We welcome user contributions to the website, including articles and reports of various initiatives that you've undertaken that are relevant to this area. So I would just encourage everyone, get involved, start projects. We're still at the very early stage of our movement where one person can indeed make a tremendous difference. And then, to join us, unless you want to sign the hard copy for, you go to transhumanist-party.org slash membership, or you can go to the free membership link, and you'll find our application, which takes less than a minute. I will take your questions, but first, I will point you to our next major event, which is our virtual meeting of the Transhumanist Party officers and Q&A session on Saturday, February 23rd at 6 p.m. U.S. Pacific Time. It will be held on YouTube, so you would be able to access the live stream via the link here, and if you uh, get the slides from me after this presentation, then the link will be in those slides. Can you send those to me? I'll yes. yeah, send this link to me, I'll, I'll post it to the Absolutely. page. Yeah. Absolutely. <clears throat> so with that, uh, I wanted also to show you this painting, this is the city of new anti-death. This is actually a painting that I commissioned from a transhumanist artist in the Bay Area named uh, Yekaterina Vladinakova. Uh, she specializes in these detailed cityscapes and spacescapes, essentially art envisioning a hopeful future. And this is a kind of city, in my view, that might arise once the vast majority of contemporary humankind's problems has been solved, once we've been able to achieve indefinite life extension, cure all diseases, get rid of the major sources of material scarcity, poverty, war, cognitive biases, all of the flaws that hold us back and that limit our potential as humans and as rational intelligences. Perhaps we'll get to live in this kind of city sometime in the future. And I certainly want to help bring that about. So thank you very much with that. I'm open to any questions. Yes. Um, so you had criticisms of the Electoral College, and it seems like there's probably some more criticisms of like the Founding Fathers and what they believed in. Um, does the Transhumanist Party like support the Bill of Rights, or um, is, there, is there certain criticisms of those amendments? Um, we do support the Bill of Rights uh, to the U.S. Constitution, but the Transhumanist Party actually goes beyond the original Bill of Rights in that we have a Transhumanist Bill of Rights that essentially specifies protections for not just human beings, but possible sentient entities that could arise through future technological progress. For instance, if a sentient artificial intelligence is developed, what rights should that entity have? And it's wise, I think, to think about these issues decades before a sentient artificial intelligence could arise, because at that point, uh, if some of these rights aren't fully articulated and embraced by the general population, we could have another civil rights crisis. There is an author and scientist named Hugo de Guerres who uh, wrote a dystopian series of books on what he calls the Artelec War. And this is a scenario I hope 
that never comes to pass. But in the Ardalek War, Hugo de Garris posits essentially another major world war between two factions that he calls the Terrans and the Cosmists. So the Terrans are the more traditional humans, the ones who think that rights are only for human beings and uh, artificial intelligence has no rights and technology should only progress so far and not any further. And The cosmists are people who welcome the open development of AI and technological progress. And in de Garris's narrative, the Terrans actually strike first and they want to destroy these artificial intelligences, but the artificial intelligences fight back. Again, this is science fiction, essentially, but de Garris at least thinks that's a likely scenario. I am not a doomsayer myself. I believe these kinds of uh, dystopian scenarios can be prevented. But they need to be prevented with foresight, uh, with thinking about these issues. So what is it that constitutes intelligence and rationality and self-awareness? What is it that makes a person capable of having rights and exercising autonomous judgment? Clearly, today's artificial intelligence algorithms are not like that. They're not general intelligences. They're what is called narrow AI, so they're domain-specific. You can have an artificial intelligence that's really good at chess or operating a self-driving car or performing surgery or being a compendium for medical knowledge, a diagnostic tool. But you can't take a medical diagnostic tool and have it drive uh, an autonomous vehicle, at least not yet. Uh, by the time AIs are capable of jumping across these domains, uh, we are going to have to ask some serious questions about uh, whether the age of AGI, artificial general intelligence, has arrived. But I would encourage you to find the Transhumanist Bill of Rights version 3.0. It's also on the Transhumanist Party website. It has an extensive preamble also discussing what constitutes a sentient entity that is capable of bearing rights. It also incorporates various provisions from the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights, except it again broadens the applicability of those provisions. But nothing in there is con in conflict at all with the Bill of Rights and the US Constitution. Uh, it's just more of an expanded version. Yes? So you mentioned that there's a common fear with automation of like the job market taking dip. Uh, does the transhumanist party have like a centralized um, opinion on maybe like universal basic income? Yes, we do have a policy plank on universal basic income in that we support everybody receiving an unconditional equal amount of income per year that would essentially immunize them against any job displacement of that sort. But even without that job displacement, uh, no matter who you are or what your life circumstances are, whether you're a billionaire or a pauper on the street, I think it would help for everyone to receive that basic income because it does take away that fundamental uncertainty. It allows a person to, in a sense, relax about existential prospects and instead focus on perhaps being creative, uh, contributing value to the world. Now, some basic income approaches are better than others. I believe that if you make basic income conditional on demonstrating need, that defeats the purpose. If you impose hefty additional taxes to pay for universal basic income, that also defeats the purpose because it impoverishes a lot of people. So in the Transhumanist Party platform, what we propose is a streamlining of both the revenue and expenditure system of government. We actually propose replacing all taxes with a single percentage of sales tax that's only levied on sales of businesses that have revenues above a certain threshold. So not your uh, product as a self-employed contractor or a small business owner, but uh, say if you go to the Walmart and buy something, there's a sales tax on that. And that sales tax would be seamless because these large businesses already have the infrastructure for collecting it. You could set that sales tax to be revenue neutral to the current federal budget and then replace all existing welfare programs with this single unconditional universal basic income. So instead of having 
a small subset of people receive need-based assistance and then having an expensive administrative machinery for verifying that they actually need it, that they're not going to spend it on alcohol and drugs, that they're going to look for jobs as they're receiving that assistance, it would be just more efficient to give everyone the same amount and say, all right, here's your safety net, but after this, you're on your own. So if you really want to improve your prospects, this should be enough for you. But if you choose to squander it, sorry, we can't help you beyond that point. Unless you want to, of course, have recourse to private assistance, charitable organizations, family, friends. Those are always legitimate alternatives for seeking help. So yes, uh, we have actually thought about this to a considerable extent. And it's one reason why we don't believe that automation is necessarily a problem. I think there's a great deal of fixation in the contemporary world on jobs and jobs as a source of meaning and purpose, which they don't have to be. Uh, essentially, jobs could be viewed very differently in a pragmatic way. Certain tasks need to be done in order for civilization to operate. But if some of those tasks don't have to be done by humans anymore, particularly the dangerous tasks, the dirty tasks, the repetitive tasks, then that frees up so much opportunity for creative labors, uh, labors where human beings uniquely excel, uh, perhaps including the creation of art or verbose rhetoric. Awesome. Awesome. Yes. So, with, I don't know, like, I haven't read everything per se, but like, what's your point on uh, like genetic testing, yes. pre, kind of like you know testing for anything that disorders, mm -hmm. mental problems, that type of stuff? Because I know in that field they're growing really fast. Yes. Being able to catch things even before they're born. Right. Right. So, genetic pre-screening of embryos is indeed becoming a possibility. Uh, the transhumanist party certainly believes in reproductive autonomy, and that includes parents being able to influence what their children are like. So we support full-fledged embryonic gene editing, uh, and I think being able to sequence the genes of an embryo will help uh, essentially recognize, oh, if this becomes a child, that child is going to have certain problems, say uh, Down syndrome, why not then edit the embryo to alleviate that problem? Or if there's a couple that's uh, planning to use in vitro fertilization, uh, why not uh, conduct the fertilization uh, to create an embryo that doesn't have that problem? So there are many creative ways uh, that I think could be deployed at a very early stage, essentially to alleviate serious genetic illnesses and also we're in favor of somatic gene editing so if somebody already has uh, a genetic illness perhaps with a gene therapy uh, they could be cured of it and lead much healthier and longer lives well thank you very much for attending i really appreciate you coming out and listening <laughs>